It may come to a surprise to those who know me that Nintendo isn't my favorite company overall. I found that when I took a look back at my childhood, most of my favorite gaming characters and music come from Sega. When asked, most commonly people say that their first video game was Mario, Zelda, or something Nintendo related. For me, there was a very specific Sega character that opened the door for me in the world of gaming. Looking back, I never knew that a series could impact me this much. So that's why in this episode, we're going to look at the history of Sonic the Hedgehog from Genesis to Mania at the main series games that kept this series running for all these years. In the late 80s, Nintendo was thriving due to the success of Mario, but as the early 90s came around, the rivalry between Nintendo and Sega would soon begin. Sega released their Sega Genesis to the world in 1990, which had a shaky start, but while the NES dominated America, the TurboGrafx-16 was more popular in Japan. With Nintendo announcing their Super Nintendo to be released within the same year, Sega needed something, or in this case, someone, to help sell their new system. Sega's savior came in the form of Sonic the Hedgehog. Oi, oi! Minna ga kimi o zuibun to matte ita zo. Dun dun o hari nezumi ora kita. Sonic the Hedgehog was created during a time when companies were looking to create a mascot. Many games came out during this time using this method, but the most memorable were Nintendo's Mario and Sega's Sonic the Hedgehog. Sega wanted to recreate the platforming genre and they did so through the concept of speed. Sega created a gaming development division named Sega AM8, later named Sonic Team. The division included icons such as leader Shinobu Toyota, programmer and producer Yuji Naka, artist Naoto Oshima, and designer Hirokazu Yasuhara. Oshima, the artist behind the original sketches of Sonic, named him Mr. Needlemouse. However, the name Sonic was chosen with a concept of speed in mind, creating the first installment in Sonic the Hedgehog. The mad scientist, Dr. Ivo Robotnik, has invaded the land, snatching up all the innocent animals and is turning them into evil robots. The only one capable of stopping this demented scientist's fiendish scheme is Sonic the Hedgehog. The goal is to control Sonic through a series of zones comprised of three levels each. At the end of the third level of each zone, you will fight Dr. Robotnik, but he always manages to escape at the end. Collect rings along the way because as long as you carry one, you can get hit by an enemy and live, but carry no rings and get hit, you die. In order to complete the game, you must not only defeat Dr. Robotnik, but also collect the six Chaos Emeralds. To do this, you must reach the end of one of the first two levels of a zone with 50 or more rings. Jump into the giant ring and you will be teleported to the secret zone. Navigate through here and find the Chaos Emerald, but beware of the goal signs, for hitting those will take you out of the secret zone emeraldless. So Sonic the Hedgehog starts right here. This game the first Sonic game right here. Like, I only remember when we first started playing this one. Well, actually, we never played it. I never played it. 
I just watched this I, demo. <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> this demo. is the, the I, I thought I was playing it right now. This is this is the most gameplay I remember playing, and I was like, oh man, can't wait to do this. And then as soon as it fades out, I'm like, oh, I wonder what the next level is gonna be. And then, and then finally, some someone came over our house and hit start for me, and I said, "What's this?" It was definitely our, our neighbors <laughs> that hit start, and that you know that's it's always so funny because like I remember this was Jim's game. Yeah. This was the one. This is the one you. I always watched. We always watched you play this one. Yeah. I don't know. I had such. I loved Sonic One for some odd reason. I don't know what it, it was. Just like the simplicity of the game that I really enjoyed, um, or it was just. I don't know what it was something about it. It's just um, the first one in comparison to the rest of them. It was just so simple, um, but I really enjoyed it. You know, um, and after playing like Mario first and everything like <laughs> that, it's different when you finally played Sonic for the first time, and you know the the whole thing was speed going fast, and now we like. When you got going over the uh, through the loops and everything, it was amazing because you never thought that like this was like a new thing at the time. Because Mario, it was fast, but it wasn't like Sonic fast. Well, it's funny because I actually started with Sonic first, and then I went to Mario second. No, that's how I, I did. It I too. never, that's I was funny. not a Mario person. I was a Sonic person first, and then um, I think one of the big things I remember about this game specifically because I was so young was that um, mom was the one who was always helping me play this game. And kinda, she actually coached me through the game <laughs> how to get to this um, this stage that we're at, at Marble. Is this Marble Hill? Yeah. So. I, I, always, I was terrified of Robotnik. The, just the song. Like, when he would come in, it was like, bana, 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 da, 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 da. and then the whole, the, he would drop down that big, ball that like wrecking ball and then he would I was like I was too terrified to move on. I could see you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Robotnik is the westernized version of the character's name. In Japan, Dr. Robotnik was named Dr. Eggman. It wasn't until Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast that Dr. Robotnik name was dropped and changed up to the correct name Dr. Eggman. Sonic the Hedgehog changed the platforming genre in ways no one saw it coming. Instead of jumping over edges, running through linear levels, and occasionally climbing ladders like in Mario or in Mega Man, Sonic introduced a faster gameplay, loops and spirals, and multiple pathways, something not seen in platformer games before Sonic. What, what, was, your, like, what was your favorite level from Sonic 1? Ooh. I'd have to say uh, Spring... Is it Spring Spring, 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 spring Zone? Zone? The song alone, Carmen, I always end up getting it stuck <laughs> in my head and I, I'm constantly whistling it. And you, get, you get so annoyed at me yeah. because you're like, stop whistling Spring Yard Yeah, Zone. it's such an annoying song. Um, I, I like uh, Starlight City Zone. Uh, everyone, that's everyone's favorite. I know, I know. It's, so, always, it's, it's, it's either that or it's Scrap Rain Zone for Well, me. because remember... Scrap Rain just for the song. Yeah, like, it, I like the song. The stage is really hard, but I enjoy well, the What I liked about the final stage is that you realize that he built his... Robotnik uh, built his whole, like, whatever it was, the his factory. whole factory on top of some ancient ruins. <laughs> and then you... It's like that ancient ruin stage, what's it called, um, that you go to... Labyrinth one, Zone. Labyrinth Zone. He is, built them on top of Labyrinth Yeah, it's on top of Labyrinth Zone, but you go through Labyr Labyrinth Zone, but you don't find out that find that out until the final stage, and so you get a, like a dose of the final, like, another mm -hmm. stage within that. You're like, oh my god, this whole story is like, a, it's like, like a, a practice before the final stage. It's, it's like it's, sort it's of wild. setting up the Sonic like, lore a little bit as well. It's really cool. I, I, that's, what I, that's what I really enjoy. That's why I like this game so Which, much. Which, I think that's why Sonic alone is, I would say, a lot better than Mario because this just, level scared me too. just the lore yeah. alone. This because, like, Mario, it was just simply Princess Peach is captured, go save it. Yeah. Sonic had so much, especially when we get into the sequels, it just well, added they, to it. And, like, Sonic always felt like it was going to have sequels. And so, whereas Mario really never felt that way, if it was another Mario game, it just felt, and eh, this is a new Mario game. With Sonic, it always felt like more than just another game. Sonic was supposed to have a love interest. Her name was Madonna, but the idea was later dropped. Following the incredible success of Sonic the Hedgehog, it wouldn't be long until Sega released the sequel. 
This time around, the team opted to include a new playable character. This was Tails, also known as Miles Tails Prowler. This time, Dr. Robotnik is back, making all the animals disappear and turning them into robots. Robotnik is out to create a doomsday machine that can take over the world. The only thing he needs is the seven Chaos Emeralds that hold exceptional powers. With them, Robotnik could have the entire world in his grasp. It's up to Sonic to find the seven Chaos Emeralds and defeat Robotnik once again, starting the Death Egg Saga for the series. I have to say, this game is what really made us basically the gamers that we are today. This game alone was the probably the most played on our Genesis at all. Sonic 2 and Tails, it brought so many, first off, it brought co-op that it was like, you know, you know the co-op's not the greatest, but at least it made us feel like the second player was playing. <laughs> Um, but it also just brought a lot of things that we made, we thought we made up in our head. Supersonic, for instance. But this is probably, in my, in my opinion, the one of the best Sonic games out there. It's it's funny because you talk about like the bad cop, and it's like, hey Carmen, you want to play Sonic 2? Yeah, sure. And then I realize I'm not playing it because I'm just playing his tails, <laughs> and you're doing all the work. Until you reach the special stage, though. Yeah. The special stage, the second player actually contributes to a lot of the game. But play. you know, it's funny, because this taught us how to teamwork with each other. That special stage, instead of getting mad with each other... We worked. It, we had to actually For work once. if we wanted to get Supersonic <laughs> by Casino Night Zone, because that was always the goal. Because then you had the rest of the game, the rest of the game you would just fly by. Um, and... I think this is what actually taught us how to work together a little bit. Right. And what's so funny is, like, even... We didn't unlock Supersonic till much later. That's and right. And it was when Dragon Ball Z was in a big in America. Yeah. It was just getting yeah. big. Oh. And we happened to watch the Japanese channel, and we knew about, like, Super Goku... It was Super Saiyan Goku. And Correction, so, it was the international channel. International it wasn't just the Japanese channel, it was the international, international channel. channel. And the international channel would always play reruns of Dragon Ball Z in Japanese. And so, but it was, they, you know, it was out before, we were already on the, we were only on the Frieza saga, and I just remember, there was a, so that's how we knew right. about Super Saiyan Goku. And we, remember we said, oh, we have to collect these Chaos Emeralds, and we thought we made it up that if we collect all the chaos all seven animals, chaos we will <laughs> turn it into super sonic and then it was like remember it was the biggest thing oh we, we loved first, it because we were like we were right because when you it saw the like message, that music to the uh like when you turn the super sonic and it's like -na 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 -na, and it's like oh we actually hear that, you ever we ever we all screamed you hear that sound of, you hear that sound effect when he first turns it and he looks so freaking cool as Super Sonic in this one. This is my favorite version of oh, Super yeah. Sonic. Yeah. And thank God, like, Mania. I mean, that, they took that sprite. Took that sprite from so this game. But was it was it that. was the craziest thing when you first unlocked Super Sonic. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was it's interesting. Um, as much as, like, the levels, a lot of the levels in this game aren't my favorite, I have the most memories with this game, mm -hmm. and especially with our cousins. Our cousins, or we bonded with our cousins over Sonic 2. Yeah. Not Sonic 1, Sonic 2. I think, and like, I think that's why it's such a big part of my life. And this is like, I mean, that cartridge is the same cartridge that we've been using since the game came out. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's just, this was the game that we all played as a family. Or like, if you went over, we I would over, always go over our buddy Ethan's house, and um, he had Sonic 2, and we'd play Sonic 2. You know, every every kid who had a Sega had Sonic 2. And really, so, it was the, it's like we even had Sonic Three, but we would always just play Sonic Two instead. And Sonic Three is a great game, mm -hmm. but <laughs> we would always prefer to play Sonic Two because I know you and I have beat this game co-op. Whether I was Sonic time. or you were Sonic, we beat this game many, many times. You, some people just yelled at me when I played it. <laughs> 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 Yushi Yamaguchi, creator of Tails, originally wanted his name to just be Miles Prower. 
The team from Sonic 2 agreed that his name should just be Tails for simplicity, but Yamaguchi ended up slipping the original name in various concept art and in the game. This led to the official name Miles Tails Prower. Development for this game was not an easy task. Yuji Naka was not satisfied with how development went for the first game and left the company. Upon his leave, Sega hired Mark Cerny, the brain behind Marble Madness, to create a new gaming studio in the United States known as the Sega Technical Institute. STI's main goal was to teach individuals that were just getting started in the gaming industry the way of the gaming development world. This would not be done by those already established in the United States, but in Japan as well. This created a huge roadblock for the development team of Sonic 2. Mark Cerny heard about Naka's departure, but was able to get him back with a promise of a better salary and more executive power. With two sides working together, both the United States and Japan, the language barrier caused problems for the team. Most of the meetings were done in Japanese, which put the American side in a bad situation. It was a challenge for the team to merge two cultures and work ethics together, but with the hype growing for the game, time constraints became another problem. A lot of levels had to be cut or never got a chance to be created, although you can access some levels through cheats such as Hidden Palace Zone. Regardless of all the problems the team faced, they were still able to create the sequel we know today. The game carries over the same gameplay as before, but added was Sonic's famous spin dash. Also added was the 7th Chaos Emerald, and when all 7 are collected, Sonic has the ability to transform into Super Sonic when holding 50 or more rings. Obtaining Chaos Emeralds is done through the special stages which also requires 50 rings to enter when passing through a checkpoint. One of the biggest additions to the series was the inclusion of a multiplayer mode. Yeah, so this game actually, it brought the multiplayer mode, which you all of us are very fond of. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so funny because like, we would play like the normal game, but then when we found out there was an actual two player mode and we found out it was race mode, that was super fun. Yeah. I loved had so deep, much fun with that. Debug mode was the thing for me. I love the debug mode in this. And, but, the, and the level select. Cheat codes. You know, that's <laughs> what the team had. Like, what we're today. <laughs> cheat codes. Oh, man. It's a, this game, this was our first experiment with uh, cheat codes, I would say. Mm -hmm. You're like, what? There's, if you put up, down, up, left, right, A, and it's like, oh, there, there, you heard the little twinkle. You're like, what? What, what does that do? And then, like, you hit start. It's like, hit song 72, 90. <laughs> I, I forget the, the, what the I vaguely have in my head. It's like, 02, 04, then you gotta go to like 79. Like yeah, you have to, it's like all, you the way, all the way in the back to get the last number. There was a sound test. Yeah. Yeah. You had to go to sound test to get to debug mode because then you had to put in the cheat for debug mode in sound test. Yeah. I remember I remember that specifically because I did that. Anytime I played this game after we beat it several times, I would just go straight to debug mode just to see what I could do and how far I could go to break the game. And I just remember that was actually very fun for me to see how in depth, I could make the game crash, <laughs> or what little secrets I could find, and like maybe for like even like a speed run or something, just to get a good idea. If I click through this, what's it gonna do to the game? I will say, I absolutely loved the discovery of when you put in Sonic 3, you realize Sonic 2 takes place, like Sonic 3 takes place immediately after Sonic 2, when you beat the final level, and you know, things are like falling, like the, you know, and then you realize, oh my god, Sonic 3 is picking up right where Sonic 2 left off. There were ideas for time traveling in Sonic 2 during early stages of development. This feature was later incorporated into Sonic CD. Sonic the Hedgehog 2 was another success for Sega, but not everyone on the STI team was there. Out of the whole team that made up STI, one man stayed back in Japan to work on another game. Naoto Oshima chose to stay behind in Japan to work on a new game for the upcoming Mega CD drive, Sonic CD. The Mega CD was Sega's CD-ROM accessory for the Genesis. CD technology allowed for greater storage to create bigger games as well as the ability to include full motion videos as well. 
Unlike the development of Sonic 1 and 2, Sonic CD's development did not go through as many problems as the previous titles. Having complete control over the project, Naoto Oshima set out to create Sonic CD with his team in Japan. Gameplay remained identical to previous Sonic games, but Oshima added in a time travel mechanic, one that was supposed to be used in Sonic 2. Due to hardware limitations, a loading screen had to be added in order to have Sonic travel through time and for the required level to fully load. Besides a new gameplay mechanic, Oshima wanted to expand on the characters in Sonic's world. Two new characters were added into the game, Amy Rose, Sonic's biggest fan and lover, along with Dr. Robotnik's duplicate of Sonic, Metal Sonic. Mega CD. Metal Sonic. Sonic the Hedgehog CD. Probably one of the cooler uh, Sonic games that we've seen through. Actually, we only, we dis we discovered it through Sega. The Sega Saturn Sonic Jam was Sonic CD. Yeah, it didn't have it on there, but all the commercials were loaded onto the uh, Sonic Jam. Which is odd not to include that in it when you're going to have every single, like, old Sonic game on that. Right, and it was our introduction to Metal Sonic, who we thought was the coolest... <laughs> he was awesome. He was the coolest bad guy, because it was... I mean, it wasn't Sonic, but it was Robot Sonic. The only game that we actually had Metal Sonic in was Sonic R. And so, to see a game that was centered around Metal Sonic was really cool. And we used to think that um, that one enemy in Sonic 1 was Metal Sonic, but sadly, it wasn't Metal Sonic, so all we wanted to do was fight Metal Sonic. <laughs> because remember, in Sonic 2, you fight Silver Sonic, which obviously is not as cool-looking as Metal Sonic. And then they had the uh, OVA cutscenes. That were the animated cutscenes, which and they were the coolest thing ever. That's and, that made us fall in love with oh, Sonic. Oh, it was even it was more. like watching a whole new cartoon, and it just got us onto the game. Upon westernization of Sonic CD, Sega of America felt the need to change the soundtrack completely. Apparently, they thought the original Japanese tracks were too similar to other electronic music produced at the time. Little Planet, a tiny planet that orbits around Mobius, appears above Never Lake. Within Little Planet are seven mystical time stones with the power to alter time. Dr. Robotnik heard about these stones and invaded Little Planet in order to find them. When Sonic arrived to Never Lake, he noticed that Little Planet has already been taken over by Dr. Robotnik and his robots. Dr. Robotnik releases Metal Sonic and captures Amy Rose. Sonic must find all seven time stones and defeat Dr. Robotnik yet again. When Sonic CD was westernized, they changed Amy Rose's name to Princess Sally, a main character from the Sonic animated series. This was done because Sega of America wanted to market both products together, so players thought that both characters were the same. With the release of Sonic CD and the huge success of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 in America, Sega would not be stopping their train yet. Sega quickly decided they needed to keep this ball rolling to create a third installment, as well as a new character to the main series through Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles takes place on a mysterious floating island. Dr. Robotnik crashed his death egg on this island and is out to capture the Chaos Emeralds in order to rebuild his death egg. To guarantee his plan is executed, Knuckles the Echidna is tricked by Robotnik and is told that Sonic and Tails are the ones trying to steal the Chaos Emeralds. So Sonic 3 and Knuckles. 
And it's the perfect sequel. You know, usually a trilogy of games don't end up being that great, but Sonic 3 and Knuckles was like the perfect sequel, besides Sonic 2. Yeah, it just adds so much more to the story, where Sonic 2, where it's sort of trying to create a new like saga in the story, such as the, like, the Death Egg saga, because that's what it's sometimes deemed online as. Um, this really adds more into the story. You get a new cool character. Dr. Robotnik's um, bag, uh, or robots are more intense this time around. Like the boss fights are substantially more intense. Um, and just Knuckles in general is kind of a mystery, actually. Right. In the beginning. And this was the inc first inclusion of Knuckles, where we finally get to see a new character. It's not Sonic and Tails anymore, it's Sonic, Knuckles, and Tails. And not to mention, most of the story was, to was told without dialogue. And you knew that Knuck Knuckles at one point was duped, in or like tricked in in by Robotnik, and then he ends up being on your side, and it's the biggest twist ever. You're like, oh, he's on my side now! And, right, and, and it's yeah. the perfect lead up into Sonic and Knuckles, where that was the coolest thing, was to play as somebody that wasn't Tails, somebody that wasn't Sonic, it was Knuckles, who could glide, he could climb. He had different pathways too, Right. and even when you put the two together, to make Sonic 3 and Knuckles, now you had Knuckles on all the Sonic 3 stages, but taking even more different paths, different bosses, pretty much just Egg Robo, a lot of the clone boss, but still, I mean, he had a completely different pathway and a different story than what Sonic was doing. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was originally supposed to use a processor named the SH-1 chip, which allowed cartridge-based games to have 3D graphics. This was Sega's answer to Nintendo's Super FX chip. Plans fell through and Virtua Racing ended up as the only game to ever use Sega's SH-1 chip. Not wanting to go through the same troubles with the development of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Knocked demanded that he was given the ability to work primarily with the Japanese half of STI, in order to avoid any problems like before. Knock was able to work with the Japanese half and was also named producer for Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Sega gave the American half of STI the job of creating a game to hold fans down while Sonic the Hedgehog 3 was developed. That game was Sonic Spinball. is what it's going to feel like. Sonic Spinball. It's coming. Keeping gameplay primarily the same except for the new items and special stages, the team set out to create a much larger game than previous installments. Zone inspiration came from the world that surrounded the development team and were much larger than any zones previously created. The team created 14 zones, but due to the size of these zones, the game was split into two separate games, producing the game Sonic and Knuckles. Using lock-on technology, you can attach Sonic the Hedgehog 3 to the top of the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge to play the game as originally intended with all zones, three playable characters, bonus rounds, and all 14 special stages. What came first, Sonic and Knuckles or Sonic 3? Sonic, Sonic 3, 3 and then Sonic, 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 Sonic and Knuckles. So yes. Sonic and Knuckles was basically like the DLC of back in the day. It's, yeah, it's sort of like Sonic yeah. 4, if you want yeah. to really put it that way. It's like I didn't think of it at that time, but now that I look back on it, I'm just like, wait a minute, was this just? It's more. I wouldn't call it DLC. It's more of the complete version uh, of because this they, is what the game was supposed to be. It was this, supposed to be both of them both put into DLC. I, yeah, and there was actually supposed to be a copy of the game that was going to be just it was one single part that was going to have both yeah. of them. I don't think it got released. It never though. did. No. But I remember, actually, I remember this multiplayer more than I remember Sonic 2's. Because of the, one, the music and the levels. But the, for real, the multiplayer in this game was a lot of fun. Uh, it was, it, it fixed what was the stretch, the stretch screen from Sonic 2. And, you know, it was more, we had a lot of fun with this one. I just remember um, just playing, even though the levels weren't that, unique it was and it was sometimes kind of cheap but we had a blast with the multiplayer mm -hmm. and they're all 
cut levels from yeah. most of them are cut levels from the actual game which is kind of cool right so they still use they have the mm -hmm. assets and they're like oh let's throw them in the multiplayer i loved how the gameplay in this one was also changed up enough to make it new but stayed familiar to its roots yeah i think one of the cool things was the when you put the two cartridges together was the addition of hypersonic hypersonic i think that was one of the biggest shocks bring and i know it's not back. canon bring him back it's not canon but still the whole idea of hypersonic of just getting the super emeralds after you've already got supersonic was one of the coolest secrets in the entire game and then you can get hyper knuckles and super tails but i mean the coolest part was just hypersonic upon the completion of sonic the hedgehog 3 and knuckles the japanese staff of sti returned back to japan Naka and Oshima would work on Sega Saturn games such as Knights into Dreams and Burning Rangers. The new platforming gameplay style used through Sonic the Hedgehog came to an end with Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. With 3D games taking over the scene, Naka and the team would not return to the Sonic franchise until the Sega Dreamcast was released, with the return game being Sonic Adventure. Though Sega Saturn did not last close to the lifeline of the Genesis, Naka and the rest of the STI, now known as Sonic Team, knew they were bound to return to the franchise and bring Sonic into the 3D gaming world. Early builds in the game were done with the Saturn in mind, but attention shifted to Sega's next console, one with better specs and also Sega's last hope to stay relevant in the video game console market, the Sega Dreamcast. Dr. Eggman discovers a legend about a monster named Chaos. Eggman searches for the Master Emerald and shatters it, freeing Chaos. Eggman's goal is to control Chaos, use him to collect the Chaos Emeralds and conquer the city, turning it into Robotnik Land. Sonic learns of Eggman's plans and sets out to stop him yet again. You can experience the story from different perspectives depending on what character you choose to play as. Beating the game with every character will unlock the final story, Super Sonic. Probably the most awkward theme song to listen to when your family's around was the Sonic Adventure opening. It was because it was too crazy. It was so crazy. Remember? It was awesome. I mean, it was awesome. Crush 40, right? Yes. It was Crush 40. It's Crush yeah. 40. I did not know that. But, I mean, it was so in your face. Remember? It was like, boom, boom. <laughs> and, like, you just had your whole family and you're just like... I was like, just confused when Chaos came out of the building, not knowing what this thing was, and then I thought it was him going, wow, 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 and like, you know, its mouth opened up, and you're just like, what is this? And then it was just like, everything's going really quick. Like, like Sonic Adventure was the first big push in the 3D realm. It was the I mean, leap had, into Son to 3D Sonic games. I mean, we had, like, Sonic R, but, I mean, this was, like, a true... Sonic. It was the first Sonic game that was 3D. Right, and it was a. Uh, it was not. I want not open world. It was um like free roam. Free roam. Yeah. So so you could free roam, go to like, hub like the next area. Yeah, it was, it was like basically Station Square was the hub world. So that was kind. Of, it was really fun. It was so much fun. Yeah, it, I remember you guys actually got this in September around your birthdays. And um, I was so jealous because, like, oh, that was a great September. Though. Yeah, um, it was. It, you guys got the Dreamcast for your birthday. It, it got it. It was a shared gift between me and Jim. It was my birthday came first, but so we got it close to my birthday. Yeah, and we I got remember that. Sonic Adventure and Pen Pen. Yeah, well, you, Carmen ended up getting the uh, Neo Geo Pocket with Sonic. So yeah, I was so that's for another time. Yeah, but Sonic like. It was, this was, because we played this game, we were so excited for this, because we, we played it at Babbage's, um, which yeah. was, obviously becomes GameStop and everything, but Babbage's was the best game store ever. Oh man, um, the Japanese but, demo that they had. Do you remember, had? nobody, remember, it was so funny, because remember, nobody could beat Chaos Zero at the demo unit, and yeah, then I yeah. was the first one, I remember everyone like cheered because I beat it, <laughs> it was like this crazy <laughs> thing. Yeah,
In order to create Sonic Adventure, Sonic Team traveled to different locations, such as Central and Southern America, for inspiration in order to create more realistic worlds for Sonic. Once the team returned from their trip, they were inspired to begin working on Sonic Adventure under the direction of Takashi Izuka. Besides making the world more realistic, Sonic Team wanted to redesign the whole cast. Characters were redesigned through appearance and age. Some characters, like Amy Rose, were drastically changed as well as Dr. Eggman. All of these redesigns and changes marked a new era for the franchise. Along with the redesign, Sonic Team decided to bring in new gameplay mechanics. This was done in order to gain the attention of people besides diehard Sonic fans. Each character was given their own unique gameplay mechanic. Sonic has the normal speed platforming, Tails was given flight and race mechanics, Knuckles involves searching for emerald pieces, Amy Rose has a hammer mechanic, Big the Cat was given a fishing game, and E-102 Gamma was given a gun in order to include a shooting aspect to the game. With a franchise redesign and added gameplay mechanics, Sonic Adventure was released December 23rd, 1998. It was a whole new style of gameplay. So. I know a lot of people say that this game did not age well, like nowadays. Um, I still have a, like a really big fondness for this game, specifically even with how glitchy it is and how poorly written the story is. <laughs> I have a really close fondness to this, and I think this is still the essence of, like, classic Sonic to a degree. Right, and I mean, even with even with all of that, the game is still just ultimately fun. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, there's something about it that just holds my interest that, like, you know, maybe, I don't know why I like this one more than Sonic Adventure 2, but I, there's something about Sonic Adventure 1 that just holds something to, like... It is know. definitely not the perfect Sonic game. No, no, no. But it is... <laughs> so memorable and it is so fun to play. The stories, the different characters we got to play as, you know, this was the first really big time where it wasn't just Sonic, Knuckles, or Tails. Right. This was Amy, Big the Cat, E-102. Um, but you had to unlock the characters. Yeah. And that was fun. Right. Because, you know, you would be like, how do I get this character? And you you just play through it. Just It would be like, like uh, Big the Cat's now playable. And you're like, oh man, I'm so excited to play as Big the Cat. It's just fishing. Sega Bass Fishing, that's what it is. Yeah. It was a way to sell that game. The original project that was set for the Sega Saturn was originally turned into Sonic World on the game Sonic Jam. This was basically a test demo of how Sonic would move around in a 3D environment. This included different challenges to complete, as well as places to view artwork, music, and old commercials. Sega earned another success with Sonic Adventure. This was the final game Oshima worked on for the franchise. Just as it had happened in the past, it was only a matter of time until a sequel was made. Before the development of Sonic Adventure 2 began, a portion of Sonic Team led by Takashi Izuka, naming themselves Sonic Team USA, flew to San Francisco, California, making it their new base of operations. This is where STI had previously produced some of the original Sonic games. Sonic Team USA used the city and surrounding areas for inspiration to create the world they desired in Sonic Adventure 2. One of the main objectives of the team was to strengthen the aspects of what made Sonic Adventure great and make it even better. The story was created as well as new characters like Rouge the Bat, a spy trying to find the Master Emerald pieces, and Sonic's newest rival, Shadow the Hedgehog. I think Sonic Adventure 2 is one of the most memorable Sonic games no matter what time period you're in, this is the one that everybody remembers. Everybody had this in school. Everybody was talking about Sonic Adventure 2, whether they played the original Sonics or whether they were new to it or whether it's been past Sonic Adventure 2. Everybody has at least played Sonic Adventure 2 or Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Right, and I mean, even like my friend Jason, 
he played this one. He had this one. He, I don't even think he played the first one, but he always talks about this one to me. He always brings up Sonic Adventure. He always says Sonic Adventure 2 Battle is the best game. Also, everyone always brings up the Chow Garden in this one, too. They, everyone was a big Well, everything that. about this game, it took everything from Sonic Adventure 1. And obviously they removed some things like the free roam and everything, but they took everything from Sonic Adventure 1 and just tried to make it a little bit better, adding like surf, more surf levels, upgrading the whole Chow Garden system. They cleaned making, up a lot of the glitches. Yeah. Um, now, voice acting, uh, <laughs> and still, the, and the mouthing. <laughs> that's still, but remember, this the game was also kind of rushed out. Yeah, at they the get end. it out. You have that story down. Yeah, so like, um, one of the big stories about this is when they were trying to get the game out, they were trying to figure out a way to um, match the English, the Japanese dialogue with the English dialogue, and because they were pushing it out and translations weren't going as well as they thought, a lot of the mouth movements were made specifically for the Japanese dialogue, which is somewhat different, and so you'll have a lot of times where characters are overlapping with the, um, the I'll make you eat those words! The faker, you're the faker here, Shadow's going on in a sentence, and then Sonic comes on top of that. It's because in Japanese, the language is much shorter to say what they need to say, but the characters just rush into it so that they can get it out. Sega kept Shadow's role in Sonic Adventure 2 secret for a long time. It was not until Fantasy Star Online was released that Shadow's true intentions would be known. This was due to a demo disc of the first level in Sonic Adventure 2, which was included with the game. The team focused on using three different play styles specifically from Sonic Adventure only for this game. The Sonic stages, which both Sonic and Shadow shared. The shooting stages used by E-102 Gamma, but Tails and Eggman share this playstyle. And lastly, the treasure hunting quest shared by Knuckles and Rouge the Bat. Sonic Adventure 2 was released June 23, 2001, in order to release the game on Sonic's 10th anniversary. A special limited edition of this game was also released, known as Sonic Adventure 2 Birthday Pack. This included different items such as a music CD, history book, and a golden coin. This is the first time you get to play as Dr. Robotnik as a full-on playable character, not right. a racing character. Oh, Which, that and so it, cool. that was like a cool idea, because it was like, yeah. oh, playing as villains back in the day was the coolest thing ever. Oh, it was awesome. I remember thinking, me and my friends thinking that the story of this was so cool, but then you start to, <laughs> as you get older, and again, <laughs> I have a fondness with this as well, because uh, the story is so strange for this. But back then it was so cool for like somebody who was in middle school or like even below that. But then you get as you get older you start to realize like, okay, the story has its plot holes, it's got its um, interesting things that they do, like blowing up the moon and, and um, <laughs> Dr. Obonic being a complete terrorist what, but getting away with it and just so much so many random things in this one that don't make sense. What was that really funny thing you told me about Gerald Robotnik and uh, Doctor versus Doctor Robotnik? Gerald Robotnik had his, his all his reasoning was justified for what he did, but Doctor Robotnik was not justified at all. I'm not sure. What, it, it, it was either it was something like that where like no Gerald had that was that was a good reason to do that. Like I can understand why he was upset, and then Doctor Robotnik for no reason. I mean, but like, that's sort of a mystery though because you don't understand. They don't fully explain Dr. Gerald in this game, you get good glimpses of Into the Past, which was cool because you got to see Dr. Robotnik's real, like, kind of family history a little bit, and it kind of adds in that, like, oh, there's so much more to this than just being, like, some animals running around. This has so much deeper, like, story for Dr. Robotnik, even, and other characters, and, um, I mean, that's personally why I like the game. It also had great music. And it most, oh. uh, uh, well, in terms of great music, it had memorable music. Yeah. Like, a, a new Crush 40 song, what was it called? Live um, and Learn. Live and Learn, you, you know, and uh, then you got uh, all the Knuckles songs, and then you got that jazz from, like, Rouge's levels, and Sonic's, like, hyped up levels, and it, it was just, it was, it was, it was, it was the, Tales the is motivational music. Yeah. 
Yeah, I never realized that actually Tails has motivational music. <laughs> Even with two big Sonic games on the Dreamcast, the console as of March 31st, 2001 would be discontinued. Sega left the video game console industry to focus making games for other systems such as Nintendo GameCube and PlayStation 2. Besides a few spin-off games that were created, it would take two more years until games were created for the main series. The next two games that were developed were Sonic Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog. There was a lot of pressure on the group as to whether Sega could produce quality work without the backing of a Sega console. Sega looked to Sonic Team for a new installment to the Sonic franchise. Sonic Team, under the leadership of Takashi Azuka, set out to make a new game, but did not want to make another adventure title to avoid core gamers being the only customers. In order to separate themselves from the adventure genre, Sonic Team implemented a team-based mechanic in a large cast of playable characters through Sonic Heroes. first saw Sonic Heroes in a magazine, and the first characters that showed up were the Chaotix. I instantly knew who they were because I had a history of going on Sonic HQ and seeing Knuckles Chaotix, so instantly I was like, a new Sonic game, oh my gosh, they're adding in the Chaotix. I didn't realize how they were going to do it though, with the three characters at once, <laughs> and almost trying to make it like it was a... 2D Sonic game, but in 3D. But they also had left out Mighty. Yeah. Which, which I did, that, that like, kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. And I was just like, why you left out Mighty? You know, like, yeah, and I mean, Sonic Heroes, it was, the idea was cool because it was like, wow, we get to play as all these characters, but it was kind of, at the end of the day, very lackluster, in my opinion. It would just seemed like, it would, didn't seem, like, very, it wasn't that exciting. What? Yet. One of the things I didn't like about it, um, like, while it was a cool idea, like, when you played as Team Sonic, Team Sonic was all about, like, it, it had its own, like, it was like the normal mode. Team Dark was the hard mode, and every everybody had the same stages, but sort of different pathways and different, like, layouts, but the Chaotix was probably the worst one, because... Team Rose was easy mode, but the Chaotix was all mission-based. Like, go find three turtles. Go right. find these seven chows across the stage. Go find a key hidden inside of a rock. And so you were going all over the place, but, like, you had three stories that were just start, go, start to finish. Sonic gets a letter from Dr. Eggman saying that in three days he will be releasing his newest weapon onto the world. Sonic gathers Tails and Knuckles to help him defeat Eggman. Along the way, they run into various other teams, including Team Chaotix, Dark, and Rose. Shadow has returned, but his memory is gone and searches for Eggman to learn about his past. The letter that Sonic received was actually from Metal Sonic, who has been holding the real Eggman captive. The Chaotix are the ones to save Eggman in the end. All the teams meet up to work together to fight Metal Sonic. The game relies on team-based gameplay, having one character focused on speed, one on flight, and one on power. You can easily switch between the three characters to progress throughout the level. You will need to use all three characters and their powers to get through each level. Sonic Team decided to bring back three of the Chaotix, Espio, Vector, and Charmy, all characters who have not been seen since the 32X game Knuckles Chaotix. Two more characters were also created, E123 Omega and Cream the Rabbit, who was first introduced in the Game Boy Advance game Sonic Advance 2. Fans had also been demanding the return of Metal Sonic, who had been absent in Sonic games since Sonic 3 and Knuckles. To please the fans, Sonic Team hired Kazuyuki Hoshino, the original designer of Metal Sonic, to redesign the character, allowing for his inclusion as the antagonist for the game. Development finished and the game was released in Japan on December 30th, 2003, and hit Western Shores in February 2004. Although it was cool to see Metal Sonic. Again. Like, and after, after and it turns into a... It was, it was Metal Sonic in a, <laughs> in a Metal Sonic in a trench coat. And I remember oh, that yeah, promotion. Yeah. He was like he was wearing like this this like like torn up trench coat. It was cool. It was raining. Yeah, it was raining. Yeah. Cool. See, but <laughs> stupid me didn't realize that was Metal Sonic. And so I was really shocked 
at the end when he showed up, I was like, oh, it's Metal Sonic! And I was like, yeah. Yeah, we were all just You didn't okay. see that in the beginning? I was like, oh, that was Metal Sonic. I, I also didn't like how, I don't know, there was like the special move. Like, I love the Chaotix. But their special move was so annoying to use because Vector would scream at the top of his lungs, and it was so loud. And I, I just didn't want to use the special. Oh, yeah, move Charming was on a bass drum, and then uh, SP was on the I think the sitar. And, yeah, like, and Vector, Vector was, just got on the mic and screamed. It screamed. It was so bad. And I was like, this is not fun anymore. I mean, it seems that the early 2000s was an experimental time for Sonic Team. After the completion of Sonic Heroes, Izuka was ready to jump right into the development of their next big Sonic game. They were not going to return to create Sonic Heroes 2, nor were they going to go back to the adventure playstyle. This time around, Izuka set to create a game to appeal to an older demographic, especially those who typically would not play a Sonic game. The character Shadow was chosen to star in his own video game, Shadow the Hedgehog. The game took inspiration from films such as Underworld, Constantine, and Terminator. This game was much darker than the games previously made within the franchise. Sometime after the events of Sonic Heroes, Shadow finds himself pondering about his past and reliving old memories. All of a sudden, the Black Arms alien race attack Westopolis, and Black Doom comes to Shadow and tells him to obtain all the Chaos Emeralds, and in return, will inform Shadow about his past. Shadow has to choose between helping his friends or the Black Arms alien race. Alright, <clears throat> so Carmen, didn't you get Shadow the Hedgehog as a Christmas gift? I did, actually. Um, I'm not mad about it, because I wanted it. Um, and I didn't have to pay for it, so that's... Hey. <laughs> I mean, it was a Christmas gift, and I was very thankful for it. Um, but so the Shadow of the Hedgehog is one of the worst Sonic games I've had the pleasure of playing. It has no substance. Shadow just is doing random stuff the entire game. I think the first time I actually saw it actually images of Shadow the Hedgehog was on a Sonic website and it shows him grinding and then the second picture was him with a gun and I thought, no, that's not happening. And three days later, it was that video of Shadow, the opening intro of him standing at the top of the city and the rock music starts to din it, din it, din it, it. And he pulls up the Uzi and he goes, and he looks at the screen and he just rushes down. And I just remember that, me being like, this is not real. This is not happening and it's showing gameplay and Crush 40 comes in, I feel no hero, hero! And I was like, no, I can't, this is not happening. But then I'm seeing him teleport and he's doing all these cool things. I'm thinking, this might actually be an okay game, maybe if I don't use the guns. No, instantly right off the bat, right in the CGI beginning, the one character, Devil Doom, shows up. And one of the first things he says to Shadow is, I know your past, follow me if you want to figure it out. And Shadow blindly says, well, like it or not, I have to believe him. And rushes down to the city and just starts attacking Gun. Blindly. And then he comes up to Sonic, where Sonic says, he's like, hey, we gotta get rid of these black creatures. And then... Shadow just either can choose to be with Sonic or be with uh, Devil Doom. This action-adventure game involves controlling Shadow by running through numerous levels, collecting rings, and destroying enemies. Unlike previous Sonic games, Shadow has been given the ability to use lifelike guns to defeat enemies. Each level allows the player to choose to venture on a light, dark, or neutral pathway. This allows the player to take different pathways, also allowing the player to play the main story numerous times. Shadow the Hedgehog was released November 15th, 2005, and was hit negatively by the critics, but did decent in sales. The developers must be commended for taking the risk in attempting to keep the Sonic franchise unique. Since the risk did not end favorably with Sega, they sought to give a rebirth to the series. They decided to go back and take elements from the Adventure series and bring Sonic back to his roots with the next main series installment, Sonic the Hedgehog, later dubbed Sonic 06 by fans.
Development began shortly after Shadow the Hedgehog was finished. Even though this was supposed to be a rebirth of the franchise, the development team had numerous ideas that they wanted to grow upon in order to make this the ultimate Sonic experience. At the Electronic Expo of 2005, a video was shown behind closed doors of what the team wanted to accomplish with this upcoming game. song in Sonic 06, the His World, and I think yes. I might have been in 6th grade at the time, and I would play that song, I thought it was the coolest Sonic song, I was so pumped for this game, I remember the, the promotions for this game, they were like, it's going to be the best Sonic game, and so I kept playing that song on repeat, I thought it was so cool, I was jamming out to it in 6th grade, I had it on my iPod, I mean on my uh, MP3 player, I'd go to school, I'm listening to it. And then the game came out. And we were just all disappointed. It was... It, it was... was oh, I, I actually gosh. played... I played the demo in a GameStop. And I just remember it being so broken. I'm just like, well, it's just the demo. And, and then when you know, he bought the game, and I was like, no, oh, it's still pretty broken. Yeah, like, they I, just added too much. It was just too complex. They had the right idea mm -hmm. abandoning the Heroes engine. But they just rushed it out, and like, I, I get it, there's the whole story about them, the reason it's bad is because they rushed it out, yeah. but that's no excuse. What it was supposed to be originally doesn't matter because of what, like, what we got. Mm -hmm. I remember immediately off the bat, some of the things I took note were the plot holes immediately, um, just some of the engine stuff, they had a couple of just running sequences. And I remember, you watched me play this game, and I would die consistently. Yeah. This is probably one of the first Sonic games that I was really bad at, but it wasn't intentional. It was the game itself. Like, trying to there, run over... It was giving that free ability to run over the water. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be a cool thing, but it was so broken. I remember the I, characters they added, too, were so cool. Like, I actually like Silver. A lot of people don't. I think his character was really interesting, and it was a cool way to introduce some new characters. They added Blaze in from the Sonic Rush series, kind of in a shoehorned way, but like, it didn't matter. It was so cool to see these characters, you could play as them in their stories. I just, I love them. It just was so bad. Yuji Naka resigned from Sega, which put pressure on Shun Nakamura to release their rebirth of the series. The game was rushed out in order to release it before Christmas of 2006. The game was received poorly, filled with many glitches, lacked features that were promised were missing, controls were bad, making this among many the worst Sonic the Hedgehog game ever. There was supposed to be a port of this game for the Nintendo Wii. The development team would have had to recreate the game for Nintendo's hardware, but instead of doing that, they decided to use that time to create Sonic and the Secret Rings instead. One has to commend Sega, for even after the failure of Sonic 06, Sega refused to give up. As they have done in the past, Sega instantly began to create a new Sonic game. Sonic is on one of Eggman's spaceships, and little does he know that this is actually one of Eggman's traps. When Super Sonic gets to the special room, Eggman turns on a machine that removes the Chaos Emeralds from Sonic's possession and accidentally turns him into the Werehog. Eggman uses the Chaos Emeralds to shoot a beam down at the Earth to break it into seven parts, and also shoots Sonic down to Earth where he meets Chip. Sonic and Chip set out on an adventure to go to the seven ancient shrines to return Earth back to its former self. 
So I remember the first time they showed Sonic Unleashed was on Easter. They were just showing um, just pictures of... They didn't show the beast form of Sonic, like the werewolf. They just showed Sonic in like sort of a shadow of like this monster. And so I kind of was excited about it, but I wasn't sure how it was. And then pictures were leaked out of what it was. And the, in like, the engine that they were using was different than the Sonic Adventure one. So I wasn't really sure and I wasn't really excited and um, when I picked up the game finally, it was okay. I actually really do like the game though, because I like the setting of the game. I like the go going to different parts of the world, but those Werehog levels are so god awful. It was the God of War type yeah, of thing. Yeah, it was. And that's when God of War was so, I guess... It was. It's still big today, but it was like that's when no, that type of gameplay was really like a big thing. Right. I believe so. Was this the game that had the quick time events that you're able to pause them and then? Uh, yeah, the last like several bosses actually, specifically the last level. <laughs> I remember this. There was a like, ton of quick time events in the game, and I remember I got I was really good at them up until the later ones in the game where I would pause the game and I would memorize what the quick time was, and I would just be like, just really quick. <laughs> The game was directed by Yoshihisha Hashimoto. The goal for the game was for people's reaction to be, wow, Sonic is back. Sonic was once again redesigned by Kawamura. They sought out to find a way to balance both the modern and classic designs of Sonic. Early on in development, the team decided that Sonic would be the only playable character. This was done in order to focus on the game mechanics for Sonic and not have to worry about the mechanics needed for other characters. However, the team added in the Werehog gameplay mechanic. Hashimoto knew this might cause problems with the fanbase, but was hopeful that the fans would accept this new form of Sonic. Sonic Unleashed was slammed with mixed reviews, but Sega continued to search for a way to make Sonic great again. Their next few games would continue trying to capture what made Sonic great in the past while implanting new gameplay mechanics. The next batch of games created were Sonic the Hedgehog 4, Sonic Colors, Sonic Generations, and Sonic Lost World. Each one had its own gimmick and focused solely on controlling Sonic and no other characters. Sonic the Hedgehog 4 brought Sonic the Hedgehog back to the classic platforming days. The game takes place after the events of Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles, but before Sonic Adventure. The game was released in two episodes. Episode 1 focused on Sonic's rivalry with Dr. Eggman, whereas Episode 2 focuses on Sonic's rivalry with Metal Sonic. Probably the most, the biggest letdown ever. After being a fan of the original Sonic game, Sonic 1, 2, 3, Knuckles, and CD, yeah. we finally hear Sonic 4. Sonic the Hedgehog 4, you're like, the game everyone's been waiting for, the continuation of the story, <laughs> and then we got that. Son the real Sonic 4. <laughs> it was... I just remember when I first played it, thinking, oh, this is not good. This is the worst, it literally was the worst Sonic game at the time, in my opinion, because it was literally just Sonic 1 with the homing attack. They had pretty much everything laid out for you in the sense of like, almost like it was specifically meant to be only played on one pathway, whereas like the original Sonic games are multiple pathways. Um, I, the, I don't, the, they didn't do the marketing for Sonic 4. I didn't think it was that great. It, I just remember seeing it and, and just saying, I think I can pass on this. I you mean, know, <laughs> the first, the only thing, they kept showing little glimpses of each stage in it, and it would like, I remember it would start with Sonic running, and then it would just go into a five second clip of that stage, and I was like, okay, well that's just Green Hill Zone, that's just the Aquatic Zone from Sonic 1, that's just Scrap Brain Zone, and I was just like, what are, this is just the same and game. The, and then you see the first boss, it's literally the Sonic 1 first <laughs> boss. And I mean, the like, last boss is Sonic 2, and then, I mean, yeah. they tried to joke about it in episode 2, where, because the first boss come, 
the first boss that you fight in that one starts to act like it's going to be the one from um, Aquatic Zone from mm-hmm. Sonic 2. But then Dr. Bonk breaks it down with four hands. And it was like, that's not a funny joke when you already know your game's bad. Like, Right. And I just, even episode two, they tried, they actually did try with that one a little bit. And I like that one better. But in general, both of them as a whole are just so bad. And they tried to make it cool by having the Metal Sonic add Metal Sonic add on. Yeah, if you bought it, both <laughs> episodes. Which that's that was the what big downfall for it was just having it in episodes. Following the release of Sonic the Hedgehog 4, Sega released Sonic Color. This was another attempt at combining both 3D and 2D gameplay into one game, which could have been an attempt to please all types of Sonic fans, but according to Izuka, it is impossible to please all Sonic gamers. Dr. Eggman builds a space theme park to redo all of his past mistakes. Sonic and Tails decide to visit because they do not believe Eggman is doing this for a good cause. They find out that Eggman has been harboring the Wisp, an alien race to power the theme park. So once again, Sonic and Tails set out to save the Wisp. This was the first game to introduce the Wisp. They are an alien race that grants Sonic different powers during his adventure. This was the game's new gimmick to alienate it from previous Sonic games. Unlike Sonic 4, Colors received better reception, and it seemed that Sega was finally heading on the right path once again. Um, so after Sonic Unleashed, everybody was kind of wondering where Sonic was going to go with like, how the engine was going to be, if they were going to go back to the adva- like, adventure style, or if they were going to go back to or keep the current Unleashed one, but remove the Werehog. And then they announced Sonic Colors. And so everybody was really excited because it was exclusive to Nintendo and it was using the current engine. I was kind of excited until I actually got the game. And it, it wasn't, it's not a bad game. It's just disappointing to me because it starts off really good and it, it's doing the whole, um, it's called the Hedgehog engine. It start, it's like really, really going through with it. And then you get into like the third stage and then it becomes just this like, 2D, um, 2.5D like side scroller, mm-hmm. but it's almost like a puzzle, and you have to use the Wisp, and the Wisps aren't bad. They're cool power-ups. But in the context that they were used, like, you could have a stage that was literally five seconds long, and all you had to do was a Wisp go underneath and drill, like, that was the point of the stage. And there's a lot of that, and it's just, it's very, it's very mission-based, but they really kind of tried to make it seem like it was going to be, like, the behind Sonic yeah. feel of Unleashed. Continuing off the success of Sonic Colors, Sega decided to become nostalgic with their next game, Sonic Generations. This was intended as an anniversary game for 2011, and Izuka had his tribute idea accepted by Sega. The game took popular levels from past Sonic games, which allowed players to play both a 2D and 3D version of the level. The gimmick for this game was that the 3D stages were played using modern Sonic, and the 2D stages were done through classic Sonic. After being defeated in Sonic Colors, Dr. Eggman finds a life form in space that can control time. Eggman decides to harbor the energy from this life form and creates the Time Eater. Eggman uses the Time Eater to steal all of Sonic's friends from his birthday party and decides to go back to the past to try and stop Sonic. This leads to Sonic meeting his past self and both of them go on an adventure through history to stop Eggman. Uh, so Sonic Generations is the game that kind of, it slowly made me come back 
to actually playing the games uh, because I mean it was for me it was just a nostalgia trip. Um, I saw I could play as classic Sonic and I loved the fact that I could just go back and play some of the old levels and um, they they made it very accessible. You're gonna, you guys are gonna think I'm weird. I actually don't like Sonic Generations. I, it's not, and it, it's very good. It was good at the time. I remember really being excited for it. Um, and it, you helped me beat the game because I couldn't beat the last boss. No, I beat the game. <laughs> um, but like, oh my god, I, the in general feel for it. Like I again, I I like the Hedgehog engine. It's not my favorite though. But when I started to play the classic levels and started to realize like. And I hate to say this, that it was not one-to-one -one with the Genesis or, like, the CD. That kind of upset me a bit, mm -hmm. because there was a lot of... It, it again, it was made by Dimps. Yeah. Um, and so it had all those pits. And it was Dimps trying to make the classical engine, but in their own style. Like and so version. it felt like Sonic 4 to me. Yeah. In the sense... But in, in a better sense. Like, for example, the spin dash and that was a shoot-off. But I will say, this was the first time that Sega actually, was Sonic Team, was listening to the fans. The game received about the same reception as Sonic Colors. The game was not bad, but it was far from being the great Sonic game fans were looking for. It seemed to Sega that this change between 2.5D and 3D gameplay was working for them. Taking that concept and the positive reception received from the Wisp gameplay from Colors, Sega created a new Sonic game exclusively for Nintendo to continue to push Sonic forward with Sonic Lost World. Sonic Team wanted to make this game 100% Sonic, with a combination of forward and side view platforming action. However, Sonic Team was set on adding a new gimmick to the Sonic game. Sonic Team added in a twisted tube-like level for its sole level design. The team did not have experience with this before, so a lot of redesigns had to be made. There was even a parkour system added, which gave Sonic new types of movement and fluid-like control. According to the Sonic producer Sam Mullen, The whole parkour system conceptually comes from the simple fact that in past Sonic games, Sonic would move really fast and he was kind of uncontrollable. And then you'd run into objects and just stop. So we went back to basic controls and said, Okay, how do we get past this? People don't like running around fast, 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 and then stop. It started out with a really simple thing. Like when Sonic hit a corner, he would just glance past it. So we thought... What if he runs up walls or grabs ledges? And it sort of evolved from there into the state it is now. Sometime after Sonic Generations, Sonic and Tails are after Eggman, because he has captured several flicky friends. In the process of this, Sonic and Tails discover a world in the sky called Lost Hex and crash land there. While on the planet, Sonic, Tails, and Eggman discover the Deadly Six, an alien race on Lost Hex. Eggman uses a magical conch shell to keep the Deadly Six under his control and sends them after Sonic. So the Sonic and Tails set out on another adventure to stop Eggman and the Deadly Six. They tried new things. I, I actually I have to give them that. They I, like, I commend them for that. Like going out of a comfort zone. Let's change the engine up. The, the English when are that, too cartoony. And that's kind of like what the whole modern era of Sonic was doing was trying to figure out a new thing for Sonic, a new yeah. style for Sonic, whether it's like how they did it for Lost World with the broken like levels and you jump to different spots and the parkour and all that stuff. Yeah. Or even like Unleashed, trying to add this new gimmick, the Wisp, you know. The whole modern era and like I think Sonic Lost World was kinda like the we need to rethink this. Especially after the game came out. It did, I don't think it didn't receive like Terribly bad reception. Oh no, it, it was it was it was definitely mixed. Um, a lot of people did give them like a pat back. Like, hey, you, yeah. you tried something new with Sonic, which is cool, but it just was not enough. Like, I, it, it just was one of those things that just I think was a good turning point for Sega because mm -hmm. of what it led to was fantastic. And I think without Lost World, 
we wouldn't have the game that since the, the two the, most the two recent games. games. Yeah. Once again, this changed the Sonic the Hedgehog did not end in Sonic's favor. The game was slammed with mixed reviews more bad than good. The reception to the game's level design was mixed and overall was not received favorably among fans. Sonic would not receive any main series games for four years. Spin-off games came out between the year 2013 and 2017. After the failure of Sonic Lost World, could there ever be an amazing Sonic game again? In 2016, Sega held a presentation at San Diego Comic-Con in July. Sega had two games to announce, one classic Sonic game and one modern Sonic game. They were both set out to release in 2017 and would almost compete against each other. Which game would do better, modern or classic? Sometime after Sonic Lost World, Dr. Eggman reviews his past failures against Sonic. At some point in time, Eggman found the Phantom Ruby and creates Infinite, a mercenary that tried to fight Eggman but failed. Later, Eggman attacks a random city and Sonic comes to the rescue. Unfortunately, Sonic is ambushed by Metal Sonic, Chaos, Shadow, and Red Devil with Infinite being the leader. Sonic is taken away as a prisoner at the Death Egg. Within the next six months, Eggman has taken over most of the world. Sonic's friends create a rebellion group to fight against Eggman in which you join the fight. So when they announced Sonic Mania and Sonic Forces, and you realized they said Sonic Mania was going to be a game, it, it was. it's obviously representing the past game. And Sonic Forces represents like modern Sonic. And then you realize they were going to be releasing really relatively close to each other. And so the what for me was so exciting was to see which Sonic game would stand tall. Is it going to be classic Sonic or would it have been modern Sonic? And then so Sonic Mania came out which we'll talk about in a bit. But then we see Sonic Forces, and so I, <laughs> I have never. I'm not one to return games and get cash back for it. But, and I hate to say this because I am a huge Sonic fan and collector of Sonic things. Sonic Forces, I beat it, and it's the one Sonic game that I ever sold back in a cash <laughs> for and I bought Doom on the Switch, which is substantially better for it. I remember when I first started playing it, we there was that demo for it, right? and the demo would end at the one spot, and I thought, okay, it's it's okay, it's going back to the Hedgehog Under. The, the problem with it was that they now narrowed it. They now <laughs> narrowed it so that Sonic couldn't go around like this, he could only go straight like this. And then... Also, I don't understand how this happens, but the story of Sonic Forces is so god-awfully bad, nobody seems to care that Sonic's been missing for years. There, Tails is worthless in it. Tails is supposed to be a super genius inventor character. Instead, he's worthless. <laughs> and then Sonic, instead of being tortured in jail for years, he's there, I think they say, for three years. He's in jail. He's stuck in the space station. You would think that... Somebody would try to kill Sonic. No, he's up there, and he's making smart remarks to all the villains, and he's just hanging out up there. He doesn't seem to care that Earth has been <laughs> taken over by Dr. Obonic. No, he's, he's up there having a good time, and then he breaks out. He breaks out, and then he goes back to Earth, and they're all just like, Sonic, you're alive! This game took three to four years to make. Development began back in 2013 after the completion of Sonic Lost World. Reception to this game was poor. The story, gameplay which was dumbed down from prior engine, and the length of the game were all factors into this game's poor reception. 
The other reason this game received poor reception was due to the high reception to the other game announced at San Diego Comic-Con Sonic Mania. Development for Sonic Mania began in 2015 led by Christian Taxman Whitehead, a programmer responsible for a number of great fan games and bringing some of the retro Sonic games to mobile. Whitehead presented an idea for a new Sonic game called Sonic Discovery to Sega. It was going to be a new but small Sonic game. Whitehead used his own retro game, a game engine focused on creating two-dimensional games, which he used for his ports of the Sonic games on mobile. Izuka was not sure of the idea, but suggested the game had old levels from past games, but remixed to make them feel new. Izuka was responsible for renaming the game to Sonic Mania, a working title that ended up sticking. Whitehead received the green light and assembled a team to help create the game. Whitehead teamed up with programmer Stealth of Head Cannon, who gave Whitehead assistance in programming. Level designer Jared Castle, art director Tom Fry of Pagoda West Games, as well as T. Lopes for the musical score. Izuka and Sonic Team only provided the Mania Team guidance and kept them on track. The team even got Tyson Hess, one of the artists for the Archie comic series, to do the opening and ending animated sequences. Altogether, the team worked incredibly hard and created Sonic Mania, a Sonic game that will receive high praise. Sonic Mania takes place after the events of Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Sonic and Tails get a reading of a powerful energy source from Angel Island and head to investigate it. The energy source is coming from a powerful ruby known as the Phantom Ruby. Upon arriving, Dr. Eggman has already sent a team of Egg Robos to extract the ruby from the ground. The Phantom Ruby gives the Egg Robos new powers turning them into hard boil heavies. The Phantom Ruby sends Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles through old and new locations where they set out to stop Eggman from using the Phantom Ruby in evil ways. So when they finally announced that there was going to be two Sonic games, and it was at that uh, convention. The Sonic convention. The Sonic convention. And we, there's been talk about it, and they said it was going to be a modern game and a classic game. And we already know the modern game was Forces. Now, there was a lot riding on for the classic game, and... Were the rumors were coming out about it, and yeah, there was a lot. There was so many rumors, and Carmen, do you guys remember? <laughs> Carmen said, he said, if the game is not good, he yeah. said, Carmen said he was going to get a garbage bag, take everything that was Sonic in our house, and put it and, in, a, in a garbage bag and throw it away. Yeah, like, and throw it away. And so, you, Carmen. The convention was on, we were watching the live stream. Carmen was, um, you, where were you? I was at a rehearsal, and so I couldn't have my phone, because I was in a show. And so Jim and I <laughs> were the only ones, basically, we were the only ones that could watch it, and... Oh yeah, we Car made, We yeah. told Carmen not to watch, and now, it was about the time to see the, the Mania, Sonic Mania was just got, just got announced, and so... It was. We, they showed the initial trailer, so Jim and I were just like, watch it, and then we're blown away. We were blown we're, away, we're, like just I, from like it when you saw right when sh sh like it shows like the clap, like what the sprite of Sonic was gonna look like, and it, he comes and breaks through the glass of Studiopolis. I was <laughs> remember Jim and I were like, oh my God. I, I don't think I've I, I I haven't been that excited for a Sonic game in a for de for like a decade. It and just... I remember we told Carmen not to watch it. Yeah, don't we, watch we, it. Yeah. We purposely built it up for you to make it the other No, we, we told him it was gonna be bad. But I remember like... a bunch of my friends had texted me. Um they're like, did you see the new Sonic game? And I just said, I haven't, I'm not home yet, I'm getting home in like ten minutes, I will go see it. <laughs> I'm seeing all these text messages from my friends who know I like Sonic and they're like, dude, you gotta look this up. This, and I'm thinking like I wasn't really sure what to think because I'm thinking this could be <laughs> and then there's I, this could be anything <laughs> and so I drive home and then I you guys and you then I, I I sent him a text that I just said it's bad man like <laughs> and then you came in with the garbage bag yeah I was ready I was You're ready like, to quit you, he actually said I, put it on I'm ready I had yeah it, it, and you had the same reaction yeah, and Sonic was... Mania 
it blew just me away. blew everybody away. It's the game everyone's been waiting for. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you can just see it in the reviews and the reception of the game. Even with the recent DLC with Mighty and Ray, right. it's just that a was, great that game. Was, that right and there is amazing. Yes, you know, it had it used a lot of the past stages, but Sonic Mania kind of showed, like, everybody, especially, I believe it showed Sonic Team that this is the game, this is the type of gameplay, the type of theme and style that right. people really want. You know, Modern Sonic might have been great back in the day, but there's, I just don't think they have at least that team, the Sonic team cannot do Modern Sonic. And the team... Sonic Mania received incredible praise after its release in August 2017, becoming the best reviewed Sonic game in 15 years. Due to the game's popularity, the Mania team even released an expansion to the game which added Mighty the Armadillo and Ray the Flying Squirrel, two characters that haven't been in an official Sonic game in years. The expansion also added a new level transitions, an encore mode, adding a remixed level and a pinball bonus game and finally made competition mode four players as opposed to only two. After years of mediocre Sonic games, Sonic Mania was a breath of fresh air for the franchise and gave the fans hope for Sonic the Hedgehog's future. The game brought fans old and new back into the franchise and by April 2018, Sonic Mania had sold 1 million copies. With its stunning visuals, amazing soundtrack, and high replay value, Sonic Mania was the game the franchise needed after years of doubt. From the 1990s to today, we have seen Sonic go through a number of changes, both good and bad. Whether you are a fan of classic Sonic games, more modern 3D Sonic games, or both, we have to acknowledge that there is always something to play no matter what type of fan you are. After the release of Mania, we can't wait to see what is in store for the future of Sonic and hope each game has the love and passion as Mania did. As for me, I'm going to get back to playing Sonic Mania. I got to get those Chaos Emeralds in Encore mode. Thanks for watching.